I think that if you look at the literature, there is no clear signal that vegetables are good for humans. See you later, Sniffles. Check out this review on Immunomilk from Heart and Soil Supplements from Brad. Every summer, I have suffered from allergies and exacerbation of my asthma. Normally, I am loaded up on daily decongestants, corticosteroids, and antihistamines. I began taking Immunomilk about six months ago, and I am nothing but impressed. This summer, I have rarely needed a tissue, let alone a pharmacy worth of medications. I am so happy to have a natural way to feel better. I'm stoked Brad is feeling better. Immunomilk is our grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively mazed colostrum, which is rich in immunoglobulins, immune factors, also rich in IGF-1, which helps with recovery and muscle growth. It can help with gut health, repair of the gut, and overall allergies. It's an amazingly powerful thing that I think is underutilized. This is one of our best kept secrets that more people could benefit from at Heart and Soil. So you can find us at heartandsoil.co. I take immunomilk after a hard day of surfing. It really helps with my recovery. Also want to give a shout out to the fact that we have the Kale is Bullshit shirts are in the store now. Go to kaleisbullshit.shop. We also have a shirt that says seed oils are bullshit and a hoodie and a hat and an old school Stay Radical shirt and a Carnivore MD shirt that looks like something your dad would wear, but it's a, uh, it's a more professional type of Carnivore MD shirt. Ribeye is agreeing with me uh, out the window. He's barking at something. So kaleisbullshit.shop to get the merch. We need to spread the message that kale is bullshit, which is what you'll hear in this podcast about plant defense chemicals. Seed oils are bullshit. You guys know that. So in this podcast, I talk about plant defense chemicals. There's been a lot of discussion about these recently and the notion that they're just benign for humans. They're hormetics. I disagree strongly, respectfully, but strongly. And I make the case for that argument in this podcast. I think you'll enjoy it. I talk about whether they're real, where they're found, different types. I talk about anthropology, the fact the Hadza don't give a shit about vegetables and all kinds of good stuff. I really think that this podcast will be valuable for you. If you have questions about plant defense chemicals, you want to know why the heck you should stop eating vegetables listen to this podcast. Plant defense chemicals. Are they real? Are they a problem for you? Are they a problem for other humans? This is what I want to talk about in today's podcast. There's been some recent discussion about plant defense chemicals. Some people don't think that they're real. Some people think that they're entirely good for humans. This is the hormesis effect that I've talked about many times and why I don't think that's always the case for humans, that these are hormetic stressors. So in this podcast, I'm going to talk about what plant defense chemicals are, why plants have defense chemicals, why I believe they are harmful for many people, and whether or not you should be aware of plant defense chemicals, and I'm hopefully going to be able to add a little bit more of a comprehensive framework regarding these molecules in human nutrition. This is not to say that plants don't produce compounds that have physiologic actions within human biochemistry. That is something we know. We know that plants produce chemicals that can affect human physiology. Many of those compounds are used within Western medicine to affect disease states with acknowledgement of the side effects, things like acetylsalicylic acid, which is aspirin derived from the bark of a willow tree, or at least a precursor of acetylsalicylic acid is derived from the bark of a willow tree. Digitalis is often used in cardiology settings known as digoxin from a species of plants called the foxgloves. So interestingly, within Western medicine, when we use a compound derived from plants, we are always aware of the side effects. All doctors know that aspirin can cause erosions or ulcers in the stomach because of the way it affects prostaglandins and the gastric mucosa. All doctors know that if you give too much digitalis, you can kill someone because it will affect sodium and potassium balance in a certain way within the human physiology. What's interesting to me is that within the food sphere of thinking, people don't really pay attention or don't acknowledge that similar plant compounds, chemicals from plants, have side effects that we often ignore. It seems to me that most nutritional pundits only want to focus on the benefits of these plant compounds. And I'm not saying that the plant compounds don't affect human physiology in some ways, perhaps positively, but we must not ignore the attendant side effects of these compounds. And I think that we all have to make a decision whereby we weigh the benefits and the risks of these plant compounds if we choose to include them in our diets. And if we want to really deeply or fully believe that these plant compounds are a net benefit for humans, I would argue that in many ways and in many situations, I don't think there's any net benefit from these plant compounds. And I think they are a net negative for humans. This is something I talked about previously. I wrote about it in my first book, The Carnivore Code. Many things in that book I still think are true and I would agree with. There are some things in that book that I've talked about previously that I've 
evolved my perspective on fructose, insulin resistance. I think I've had more deepened discussions of that recently, uh, et cetera. So that's a topic for a separate podcast. But what are plant defense chemicals? Well, before we answer that question, let's talk about life as a plant. Imagine yourself rooted in the ground and imagine all sorts of insects and humans perhaps in the last couple hundred thousand years or pre-hominids or primates or other animals, herbivorous or omnivorous animals that eat plants wanting to come and consume you. You are rooted in the ground. You must evolve some sort of defense chemicals if you truly wish to survive or participate in this arms race, quote unquote, as it were, between animals and plants. Animals and plants have co-evolved for 450 million years. So way, way before pre-hominids, way before primates, other animals and plants were coexistent on this planet. The separation of plant and animal lineages occurred, the separation of plant and animal lineages occurred 400 to 450 million years ago. So animals and plants have been at war, as it were, for hundreds of millions of years. So when you are a plant, you can imagine that you have different parts as a plant. You have leaves, which generally take in energy from the sun through a process called photosynthesis. You have chloroplasts, which are interesting. Most of us learned about chloroplasts in high school biology. They're able to take energy from the sun, turn it into glucose, which can be used as fuel for the plant. That's a pretty handy trick. And that happens in the leaves. Then you have a stem with bark on it or some sort of woody substance or just a green stem in which there are phloem and xylem. Those were the bane of my existence in college because I can never remember which one goes up and which one goes down. It's not important for this conversation, but there are essentially arteries and veins in a plant that move to and from the roots of a plant. And in the roots, you may store glucose or other carbohydrates, um, and the roots move out into the soil to collect nutrients, to have symbiotic relationships with fungi and bacteria in the soil, and to interact with the broader environment that the plant is in. Now, what is the point of being a plant? The point of being a plant is to move your DNA to the next generation. That's the point of most life on this planet. Life as we know it on this planet is generally DNA-based. There are some viruses that are RNA-based, but people debate whether viruses are actually alive. So most life forms on this planet use DNA to move their genetic information to the next generation. Where do plants put their genetic information? They put it in their seeds. But most plants don't just have a naked seed that they throw it into the world. Some plants essentially do that. Dandelions have seeds that are on a little bit of a, a wispy substance, like a parachute that moves them away from the parent plant. Parents cast their offspring further afield. Plants want to move. They want to spread their offspring. They don't just want their offspring growing right below them. So plants move their seeds away from them. Some plants use whirly birds, like uh, deciduous trees on the East Coast, but many plants will put their seeds in some sort of a fruit. So the fruit is interesting, and we'll talk about that later in the podcast, but we have different parts of a plant, and this is where we cross into the actual consumption of those plants. What we think of canonically as vegetables are generally the leaves, the stems, the seeds, which can be seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, and the roots of plants. And vegetable is just sort of a colloquial word, but those are the vegetable parts of plants. And then there is the fruit which is where the plant encases its seeds in something that is colorful and sweet. So I asked a friend recently, and I said, here's a riddle, what part do plants want you to eat? She didn't know the answer to that. She answered twice incorrectly. Um, but many of you will know intuitively that plants want you to eat the fruit. That is why it is sweet. That is why it is colorful. And that is why fruit changes color as it becomes ripe. Plants don't want you to eat unripe fruit because the seeds within that fruit are not ready to be moved to the next generation. But once the seed is ready to move, the fruit around it becomes ripe. It becomes either fragrant or red or yellow or orange, often from a previously green color. You can think about the way that avocados go from being green to being dark brown once they're ripe. Avocados are a fruit, yes. Uh, tomatoes, cherries, these all change in color. Oranges, bananas, papayas go from green to orange yellow when they become ripe. Fruit changes color as it ripens because many of the animals that would consume it have color vision and can sense that. If you've ever been hiking in the Pacific Northwest in the summer, you know that your eyes are drawn to a colorful berry in a particular way because there's mostly green in your field of vision. And then you see a colorful thing. Maybe it's a salmon berry or a raspberry or a blueberry or a blackberry that may signal that it is some sort of food for a human. And within that fruit, 
are the seeds that the plant is hoping to move to the next generation. But the intention of plants is very clear here. They don't want us to eat the leaves, the stems, the roots, or the seeds. They don't want us to crunch and chew up the seeds because that would subvert the plant's efforts to move those seeds to the next generation. So all of this is just painting this sort of zoological picture of the way that we as humans, omnivorous humans that I believe are animal-based, live within the world and interact with the plants around us. Many of us don't think about this because we just go to the grocery store to get food. There's an aisle of plants and it says vegetables and it says vegetables are good for you, so we eat vegetables. Mom told you vegetables were good for you. Grandma told you vegetables were good for you, probably because they're good for you relative to junk food, like cakes, cookies, candies, sodas, or popcorn. But the question that remains for many people and what I got interested in many years ago with the beginning of my foray into the carnivore world was, are vegetables good for all people? Are vegetables really good for humans? Obviously, I don't think that the answer to that question is yes. I think the answer is no. I don't think vegetables are good for humans. I don't believe plants want them to get eaten. I think it's pretty clear plants don't want them to get eaten. In contrast, they want us to eat the fruit. We know that fruit can have defense chemicals also, but those defense chemicals abate. They lessen as the fruit ripens. There's a clear signal from the plant. Whereas the leaves, the stems, the roots, the seeds of plants all contain defense chemicals that can be problematic for many humans. So that is what defense chemicals are. That is the difference between vegetables and fruit. And then I'll get into which defense chemicals we're talking about, some examples of those defense chemicals, evidence from the literature that I think supports very clearly these defense chemicals are net negative for humans, but there's a lot of philosophical ideas here that are important to understand. Another framework that I want to share with you guys from the outset is, is something that I've talked a lot about on my social media, which is if you can be fully honest with yourself, which is all that really matters, and say that you are thriving, that you don't have issues with libido, with body composition, with sleep, with mood regulation, with mental clarity, that you are just thriving, you are 10 out of 10 in everything in your life, then why change anything about what you're doing now? A lot of what I talk about with regard to dietary stuff is for those of you who are suffering. And I think if most of us, myself included, are really honest with ourselves, we would say, uh, maybe I'm an eight out of 10 or seven out of 10 in this department. Maybe I want this little uh, nagging injury to go away. Maybe there's something that I still could improve on in my diet. And I think that examining whether vegetables are serving you can be a step in the right direction for many people, especially people who are very sick. Recently on my social media, on Instagram, I shared the story of Sal Mastropolo. You can put a link to his uh, YouTube channel in the description of this video on YouTube, or maybe in the show notes on the podcast pages. But Sal reached out to us at Heart and Soil and told us this amazing story of getting uh, post-COVID strep throat, leading to systemic vasculitis, leading to glomerulonephritis, leading to kidney failure, leading to hospitalization. Now, Sal was an otherwise healthy individual who probably had a bad run of an autoimmune condition in the setting of multiple, let's just say, infectious insults. And he was able to recover from that with dietary changes. His doctors had consistently told him, you'll need to be on immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of your life. Your kidneys will never get better. They offered him no advice in terms of his diet. Sal also told me personally and talked to us at Heart and Soil about how he would go to these support groups for vasculitis and people were continuing to suffer. Nobody was getting off their meds and he was able to get off all of his meds, regain normal kidney function and return to the gym, have a normal life with intentional dietary choices. What did he do? Well, this is where it actually gets interesting. It's just an anecdote, but I add it here because I do think it adds some um, color to this conversation. The first thing he did was paleo. So we cut out a number of foods. Paleo cuts out dairy, paleo cuts out uh, beans and grains, and paleo cuts out some other foods, perhaps nightshades, depending how strictly you're doing paleo. That led to some improvement in his diet, but it wasn't until he went animal-based. Again, this is just one anecdote, but it's an interesting one that we should not ignore. When he went animal-based and he added organs from hardened soil and fresh organs, meat and fruit and honey, and he added back some raw dairy, then he was fully able to reverse his symptoms. And what's very interesting about his anecdote was that it wasn't for Sal until he cut out all the vegetables that his autoimmune symptoms completely resolved. So this is why I do this work, that I believe there are many people like that who are struggling with autoimmune disease with something that is not getting better in their life. And I think that eliminating vegetables and focusing on the most nutrient rich, most sought after, least toxic foods for humans can lead to improved quality of life for many people. But wrapped up in that whole discussion is whether or not we are losing something by getting rid of these vegetables in our diet or whether people who are otherwise thriving should eliminate vegetables. Like I said, if you're thriving, I don't see a reason to eliminate vegetables, but I think that many of you may not know how good you could be 
until you fully eliminate the vegetables from your diet. So with all of that as framework, let's move on to the next step of this discussion. So I mentioned the idea of animal and plant warfare a couple of times in the introduction to this podcast. And I wanted to share this paper to start. The title is Animal Plant Warfare and Secondary Metabolite Evolution. Um, in recent years, the concept of animal plant warfare emerged, which focused on the coevolution between plants and herbivores. That's what I talked about earlier. As a reaction to herbivory, plants developed mechanical defenses, such as thorns and hard shells, which paved the way for adapted animal physiques. Plants evolved further defense systems by producing chemicals that exert toxic effects on the animals that ingest them. As a result of this selective pressure, animals developed a special enzymes, e.g. the cytochrome P450, monooxygenases, also known as the CYP450 system that metabolizes xenobiotic phytochemicals. As a next step in the evolutionary competition between plants and animals, plants evolved to produce non-toxic prodrugs, which then become toxic only after ingestion by animals through metabolization by enzymes such as CYP450. So this is a really interesting paper that talks about this ongoing warfare, this arms race between plants and animals. And this is just to say that plant defense chemicals are very real. They're not made up. There's no question that plants contain defense chemicals. You might also consider this paper from Bruce Ames. The title is Dietary Pesticides, 99.99% all natural. Now, I don't really understand the point of this paper when he wrote it, which was in uh, 1990. I'm not sure whether he was trying to downplay the importance and effect of sprayed pesticides on plants. But nevertheless, in this paper, he's saying that the majority of humans on this planet get 99.99% of their pesticides from the plants themselves. These are plant defense chemicals. So he says the to the so he says the toxicological significance of exposures to synthetic chemicals is examined in the context of exposures to naturally occurring chemicals. We calculate that 99.99% by weight of the pesticides in the American diet are chemicals that plants produce to defend themselves. Only 52 natural pesticides have been tested in high dose animal cancer tests and about half are rodent carcinogens. So he said of the thousands of chemicals that we know that plants produce as defense chemicals, only 52 have been tested in rodents to see if they're carcinogens, albeit at high doses, half of them were. So this is an interesting rabbit hole and what got me started on this journey regarding plants and plant defense chemicals. They say in this paper, we estimate that Americans eat about 1.5 grams of natural pesticides per person per day, which is 10,000 times more than they eat of synthetic pesticide residues. Now, I certainly believe that synthetic pesticide residues are a problem for humans. I did a previous podcast on glyphosate and all of the pesticides that come with it, how they can be worse in conjunction with each other, and how there are things that the glyphosate is often suspended in, which can be problematic for humans. You can refer back to that one. But you can see here from this paper, if you're watching the video on YouTube, table one is 49 natural pesticides and metabolites found in cabbage. These all have very long names. I won't read them all. They fall into categories like glucosinolates, indole glucosinolates, isothiocyanates, and goitrin. I'll talk about those later in the podcast. Cyanides, yes, that is the molecule. Cyanide, which is toxic to humans. Terpenes, phenols. They mention below this chart in the explanation, allyl isothiocyanates, induced papillomas of the bladder in male rats, a neoplasm that is unusually rare in control rats, was classified by the National Toxicology Program as carcinogenic. Allyl isothiocyanate occurs in cabbage. So that's just one of these compounds. And the point of this is just to say that there are many plant defense chemicals, very few of which have been tested in animal studies. And we don't really know about humans. There are some studies in humans that I can reference in this podcast looking at cell culture and looking at a process called clastogenesis, whereby these chemicals may break DNA in cell culture. Whether that translates into real life for humans is unknown. Many of these things are difficult to study, but uh, there have been some small forays into actually studying these compounds, but a lot of them are unknown. As you can see in this table, there's a compound called estragol, which is found in basil and fennel. There's a compound called saffrol, which is problematic, likely for animals and humans in nutmeg, mace, and black pepper. I'll talk about black pepper 
more in this podcast a bit later. You can see there are many of these chemicals listed, and in the references, you will find that there are some studies, like I said, that look at the classogenic potential of these, the ability of these compounds to break DNA and cell culture, but we don't really know what these compounds are doing. The point is that plants make defense chemicals. End of story, full stop. The question is, are these compounds harmful for humans, or are they beneficial for humans, or are they somewhere in the middle? Is it different depending on the individual? As I've said, most of the nutritional world believes these compounds are entirely benign, and as you'll see with the evidence that I present, I am far from convinced about that fact with regarding these chemicals, and I think that we will do well to be wary of them. So let's put a bookmark right there in terms of the plant defense chemicals and sidestep for one moment and talk about anthropology. I think this is a very interesting framework, a lens through which to view these questions as well. So I went to visit the Hadza last year in Tanzania with my friend Anthony Gustin. I've talked about that trip many times in the past, but what do the Hadza think about vegetables? I can tell you very clearly the Hadza don't give a shit about vegetables. They don't really eat vegetables. While we were there, they never ate a leaf. They never ate a seed. The men couldn't be bothered with roots, which we dug with the women, almost because we just wanted to see how they did it, but the men didn't want anything to do with the roots. What the men wanted to do was hunt animals, to eat the animal meat, to eat the animal organs with us. And when they found honey, they wanted to eat that. And when we found berries, they were excited about that. And this is corroborated by people who have spent far more time with the Hadza than me. Frank Marlowe is perhaps the person who has studied the Hadza the most. He has a book, and this is a paper that I will show you that I think is quite interesting regarding the Hadza's preference in foods. The title of this paper is Tubers as Fallback Foods and Their Impact on Hadza Hunter-Gatherers. I will call your attention to this table, table one, looking at the foods eaten by the Hadza. We have honey, we have baobab, we have different types of meat, we have berries, and we have tubers. There are no other vegetables. There are no leaves. There's no kale on this table. There's no seeds on this table. The Hadza will eat those foods, but only if they are starving. That is the point that I made in my first book, The Carnivore Code, that I think vegetables are very likely survival fallback foods for humans that we would eat in the event of starvation, but probably not the first foods we would select as humans throughout our evolution, and this makes sense intuitively. Many of you will know this intuitively. Looking at this table, this is quite interesting. This is the mean preference rank on the y-axis uh, and both males and females. Both males and females think that honey is their favorite food, followed by meat in males, then baobab, and then berries, and then tubers are last for males. Females rank berries, baobab, and meat about the same, but both sexes say tubers are a distant fifth in terms of their foods. Again, there are no other vegetables other than tubers on this list, there are no leaves, there are no salads, there are no seeds, nuts, or grains on this list. The Hadza eat baobab, and I ate baobab with them, but they don't eat the seed. They might eat the seed if they're starving, but they threw the seed away. So this is quite interesting to me that within hunter-gatherer groups, there is a clear preference for meat and organs. That is very clear. Beyond that, honey, berries, other fruit like baobab, which is what the Hadza have in Tanzania, and then distant, we might find tubers as a fallback food. And as a fallback, fallback food, we might find vegetables. So the notion advanced by so many in the nutritional community that hunter-gatherers were eating lots of vegetables just doesn't hold up to scrutiny, and it doesn't make sense to us intuitively. In Costa Rica, where I live, there's a river below my house. And if I go down to the river and just spend time at the river, and I think, what would I eat if I lived here, if I were hunter-gatherer. Of course, it's a contrived notion, but I think it's an interesting thought experiment. There's nothing to eat down there other than a seasonal fruit, maybe an animal if I can catch it. If I can find a beehive, I'll get some honey. I'm not going to go eating bitter leaves if I can hunt something that has more nutritional value, more calories, and more payoff to me in the end. I might eat some leaves if I know which ones are not absolutely going to kill me if I'm totally starving, but are they going to be my first choice? No. So why is it that when you walk into any grocery store, the thing that's gonna hit you in the face, depending on the grocery store you go into, let's say Whole Foods, is antioxidants, kale, spinach, vegetables are the best thing. Eat more vegetables if you wanna thrive. You should be fiber fueled. Eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables. It makes absolutely no sense. Again, if you're thriving, why change anything about your diet? But how many of you can honestly say that you're thriving 
and you don't want to improve, you don't need to improve anything in your diet, I'll leave that for you guys to answer. I think many of us, many of our families, many of our children would be better without these foods. And just this as an aside, how many conversations that turn into crying fits at the dinner table could be avoided if you stopped forcing your kids to eat vegetables? Why do you think your kids hate vegetables? They're not excited about them because they don't, they're not good for them. Yes, vegetables are better than Snickers. Vegetables are not better than meat and organs, either fresh or desiccated, like we make it hard in soil, fruit, honey, and raw dairy. No chance. So in 2022, if you are a successful hunter-gatherer, what signal would you give your body? You would give your body the foods that it seeks most, that it craves most, that your ancestors have always sought. And I believe that is the list of foods that comprise an animal-based diet. Then you're sending more of a signal of abundance to your body eat a bunch of vegetables, you're sending a signal of scarcity to your body. And future conversations about linoleic acid will corroborate that as well. We know that many hibernating animals, at least cold weather hibernating animals, increase the amount of linoleic acid in their diet when they want to become fat and hibernate. I think that there is this idea in the natural world that for some animals, linoleic acid is a signal for hibernation, for winter, for fattening, for scarcity, I think vegetables are also a signal for scarcity for many animals and potentially humans. They're just simply not the most palatable, tasty, enjoyable, bioavailable nutrient-containing foods, and they have all these defense chemicals, which we cannot ignore. If you don't believe me, I'll just start with one paper looking at hot spices and how they affect the leakiness of your gut. And the title of this study is Hot Spices Influence the Permeability of the human intestinal epithelial monolayers. And they say that tight junctions exhibited a discontinuous pattern when extracts from paprika and cayenne pepper were added to them. They assayed the leakiness of the human gut with a anti-zonulin-1 antibody and trans-epithelial electrical resistance. So this is a cell culture study. And when the TER goes down, the permeability of these cell layers goes up. And what did they find? When they added paprika or cayenne pepper the epithelial monolayer of the human gut in cell culture became more leaky and there was more activity of this anti-zonulin-1 antibody. You can see here the observation that solanaceae spices, paprika, cayenne pepper, increased permeability for ions and macromolecules might be of pathophysiological importance, particularly with respect to food allergy and intolerance. So what do we have here? We have at least just the first suggestion that plants have defense molecules and that not all of these plants are good for you. Cayenne pepper is from a ground up nightshade plant. Paprika, the same. These are nightshades, which tend to have lectins, which are damaging to the human gut. I'll show some evidence of that later. But hot spices do appear to open the gap junctions, the tight junctions of your intestinal epithelial monolayers. That's not a good thing. That's probably why it hurts when you poop in your rectum after you eat hot spices. So not all of these plant chemicals are good for humans and opening the gap junctions, opening the tight junctions of the human gut is not a good thing. It can cause, it does cause leaky gut. It causes what we think of colloquially as leaky gut. It causes probably autoimmunity, immunologic activation, inflammation, all sorts of problems that originated in the gut probably have to do with that damage or that opening of the tight junction in the human gut. But Paul, you say, there are so many studies showing the benefits of vegetables in the human diet. Oh yeah? <laughs> Show me. <laughs> because the best meta-analysis that I can find of vegetables is this one. The effects of fruit and vegetable consumption on the inflammatory biomarkers and immune cell populations, a systematic literature review and meta-analysis. Now, notice they say fruit and vegetable consumption. So I will walk you through all of these studies. This is gonna be a little bit hard to read but there are many studies they reviewed here and they're all right here. All the references will be there. All of them are summarized here. Now, the first set of studies are all about fruit. I started this journey as a carnivore and didn't think that fruit was good for humans. That opinion, that idea changed when I added carbohydrates back to my diet. And now it makes sense to me that fruit is something that we would seek as humans that would be less toxic for us, less full of problematic chemicals. We know that fruit has less defense chemicals as it ripens. So, Studies looking at fruit extracts and human health are not what I'm interested in. What we are interested in in this discussion is vegetables 
and their effect on human health. And we must note that epidemiology, observational literature here, is going to be heavily confounded by healthy user bias in the situation. So I'm not terribly convinced by an observational study that says that if you eat more vegetables, that's associated with a better health outcome because those people are likely to do other good health behaviors. What I wanna see are interventional studies with vegetables that result in good health outcomes for humans. Those are not very large in number. So all of you out there saying there are tons of studies showing the vegetables are good for humans. Um, I would ask you to share them with me because there's not a ton out there actually. When I went on the doctors, they certainly railroaded me. Travis Stork said, there are thousands of studies. Where? Where, Travis Stork? So let's look at this paper and try and be balanced here. You can see that the majority of the studies in the beginning here are with fruits. So we'll skip over all the fruit studies, pomegranate, grape, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Orange juice, raisins, tomato juice. Here's one. One garlic tablet <laughs> equal to 400 milligrams of garlic and one mill milligram of allicin. Decreased serum levels of HSCRP. Okay, fair enough. There's a positive trial for garlic, at least in decreasing HSCRP. Does garlic have other issues that I'm worried about? Yes, I can get to those later. Here's a broccoli diet, 250 grams per day. It decreased plasma CRP. TNF alpha didn't change. IL-6 didn't change. IL-6 receptor didn't change. And adiponectin didn't change. So multiple inflammatory markers did not change. CRP went down somewhat with a broccoli diet. Okay. And granted, this meta-analysis left out multiple studies that I'll show in a moment that show there were no positive effects from adding vegetables to the diet. Here's tomato juice. That's a fruit. We'll skip that one. Here's a fruit juice uh, supplement. Here's one greater than five portions of fruit and vegetables per day, or less than two portions of fruit and vegetables per day for 12 weeks. No changes in any biomarkers. Okay. So you're telling me vegetables are unanimously good for humans or clearly good for humans? Not necessarily. Here's a six week diet containing either 810 or 196 grams of vegetables, berries, and apples per day, rich in either linoleic acid or oleic acid. And that's a lot of variables, but all that increased vegetables had no change in plasma levels of ICAM or HSCRP. ICAM is an adhesion molecule. One, three, or six portions of fruit and vegetables per day for eight weeks. No changes in levels of HSCRP, DCAM, or VCAM. Again, those are adhesion molecules. So here's an interesting study. Extensive dietary and behavioral counseling to achieve dietary goals of 20% total energy from fat, 18 grams per 1,000 kcals of dietary fiber, five to eight servings, depending on total caloric intake of fruit and vegetables, or the control diet uh, in the control groups for four years, decreased serum IL-6 concentrations. Well, yeah, they had a lot of behavioral counseling. How do we know any of that was related to vegetables? You get the idea here. You guys can look at all these studies yourselves, but there is actually an underwhelming amount. You can look at the effects here on the right-hand side. Uh, no changes in any inflammatory biomarkers. No changes in any, any inflammatory biomarkers. Some of them even increase inflammatory biomarkers. So looking at the entirety of the evidence, it's, it's pretty clear that some of the fruit interventions are beneficial. I don't think it's very clear that an exclusively vegetable intervention, many of these are mixed, but even the combined interventions are entirely or always beneficial for humans. So again, I put the reference for the study. It's a meta-analysis looking at all of the studies that were known at the time of the meta-analysis. I think it was fairly recent. And I think that if you look at this, you'll see that, yeah, the fruit studies have some benefits. The vegetable studies don't always help. Some of the vegetable studies show no benefits at all. And I'll show you some of those. So where exactly is the experimental evidence that is so overwhelming that vegetables are good for humans? I just, I don't see it that there may be a trial here or a trial there, and we can match that with another trial that shows there's no benefits. So I think that if you look at the literature, there is no clear signal that vegetables are good for humans. If you guys don't agree with that, I'm open to comments and future debates. I've done them in the past with people, but I think that this is an interesting thing to really look at the literature somewhat objectively regarding. So I'll show you guys a few studies looking more in detail at the absence of benefits for these plant foods. They're often mixed fruit and vegetable interventions for humans. No effect, 600 grams fruit and vegetables per day on oxidative DNA damage and repair in healthy non-smokers. The title kind of says it all. <laughs> the randomized into three groups, antioxidant-free basal diet, 600 grams of fruit and vegetables, or a supplement containing the corresponding amounts of vitamins and minerals, or a placebo. 
blood and urine samples. This is a four-week study. The level of strand breaks and the nuclease three sites, form aminopyridine sites, sensitivity to hydrogen peroxide. They're basically assessing many metrics looking at oxidative stress. And they say our results show that after 24 days of complete depletion of fruits and vegetables or daily ingestion of 600 grams of fruits and vegetables or the corresponding amount of vitamins and minerals, the level of oxidative DNA damage was unchanged. Okay, this suggests that the inherent antioxidant defense mechanisms of the human body are sufficient to protect circulating mononuclear blood cells from reactive oxygen species. That's a really interesting study that gets often ignored by those who think vegetables are the best thing since sliced bread. Again, there are multiple studies like this. It's not worth going through all of them. One more, increasing vegetable intake dose is associated with a rise in plasma carotenoids without modifying oxidative stress or inflammation in overweight or obese postmenopausal women. The title kind of says it all. So that is the state of the evidence, I believe, that if you look at interventional studies, many of them combine fruits and vegetables. The ones that are just using vegetables don't always show a benefit. Many of the studies combining fruits and vegetables don't show a benefit. There are multiple studies with fruit and fruit extracts that look to have some benefit. And I don't think fruit is bad for humans at all. It's something I've talked about multiple times recently. So where is the evidence that vegetables are so good for humans? I don't see it. The other side of the argument, to be fair, would be where is the evidence that vegetables are bad for humans? This is a tricky thing to do in population studies because there haven't been observational studies that eliminate vegetables. So all of the groups in observational studies are still eating vegetables. Why would we see a signal that vegetables are harming humans? One of my friends recently said, if vegetables are trying to kill humans, they're doing a really poor job of it. I actually respectfully disagree with them. I think that many people have very overt manifestations of issues with vegetables that are just seen more at an individual level that a physician treating patients will see, uh, that are case studies, that are anecdotes, that are N of thousands now in the carnivore and animal-based communities, anecdotes like Sal's, many other people, myself with eczema. My eczema, as many of you will know, resolved when I cut out vegetables from my diet, comes back when I reintroduce some vegetables, things like chocolate will trigger my eczema, et cetera. So there are many anecdotes, many case studies of humans who have negative reactions to vegetables. A population-based study has never been done looking at people who eat less vegetables and more vegetables to actually have a signal strong enough for us to see. So we've never looked for this because throughout our time as humans in the nutritional space doing science, we've always believed that vegetables were good for us. And again, vegetables are better for you than junk food. I just want to make the point that I think vegetables are the fallback of all fallback foods for humans. And many of you would be much better by replacing vegetables in your diet with things like meat and organs, fruit, honey, raw dairy. That's the point that I'm making. So if you are curious about the hormesis issue, I've done a whole separate video on YouTube called sauna versus broccoli. There's a link in the show notes on the podcast. If you want to know why I don't think the hormetic benefits of vegetables are actually proven to be net positive for humans, the short answer there is that we must not ignore the side effects. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, all pharmaceutical medications prescribed by physicians are known to have side effects. Why do we give vegetable chemicals, plant defense chemicals like isothiocyanate, sulforaphane, et cetera, a pass and ignore the side effects of those medications, which are prominent and negative in humans, focusing only on the demonstrated positive benefits when we look with myopic research blinders? I don't know why we do that. <laughs> Again, it's not to say that plant compounds don't have positive effects in humans. But anytime you think a plant compound is all good, you're probably missing the negative side effects. And I want to enumerate some of those side effects. I want to talk in detail about specific plant defense chemicals next to get a little more granular with this discussion. But do not ignore the side effects of these chemicals. On Rogan's podcast, Joe's often said that he thinks of broccoli similar to a sauna, that it's just getting you a hormetic benefit. And that was why I made the broccoli versus sauna video Broccoli is different than a sauna, in my opinion. One of them is an environmental stressor that isn't a molecule that you put in your body. It's going to create oxidative stress, going to activate the NRF2 system, and going to create an increase in glutathione and other compounds, enzymatic systems in your body that manage oxidative stress, yes. Broccoli has compounds that do the same thing, but those broccoli compounds have other negative effects. I think that if you look at the literature, you can make a pretty strong case 
that broccoli doesn't add anything to your physiology. We do not know, and I think that there's evidence to the contrary, that broccoli does anything above and beyond what you can achieve in your own life through exercise, through sauna, through cold plunging, through fasting, through sunlight. These are environmental hormetics. And I think that most of us who are eating a good diet, just as it said in that paper with 600 grams of fruit and vegetables with no effect on oxidative stress, the endogenous antioxidant mechanisms for most of us are adequate. They're all we can get. They're the best we can do. Adding vegetables doesn't give you any more than that, is my belief. And then you get all of the attendant side effects. In the case of broccoli, you get isothiocyanates, which can be harmful to the thyroid. These side effects are being ignored. So that's a really important point that often gets overlooked in these discussions of plant defense chemicals, but it's something that I've been doing my best to communicate as clearly as possible for quite some time now. While we are on the topic of broccoli, this paper I think is quite striking. Concentrations of thiocyanate and goitrin in human plasma and their precursor concentrations in brassica vegetables and associated potential risk for hypothyroidism. It's a long title. The takeaway is that in certain brassica foods, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, and some Russian kale, there is sufficient amounts of an isothiocyanate called goitrin to potentially decrease iodine uptake by the thyroid. So often we hear about sulforaphane, but the most goitrogenic substance in these foods appears to be a compound called goitrin. Goiter is the enlargement of the thyroid gland that happens when we become hypothyroid due to inadequate amounts of iodine in the human diet or these compounds in plants robbing us of the ability to absorb these things. But this paper is suggesting that in amounts commonly consumed by humans, there is sufficient amount of goitrin to significantly affect the iodine uptake at the level of the thyroid. Why would you eat something with that potential if you're not getting any net benefit, if you're not getting any benefit that you can't get by living your life in other ways? This is my argument about vegetables and about plant defense chemicals. Again, I think they're harmful for humans, and I think that consistently we can see they are a net negative. What are some other types of plant defense chemicals? Well, let's talk about oxalates. Oxalates are dicarboxylic acids, often found in seeds and beans. And we know that oxalates can accumulate in the human tissue and cause problems. There is a very striking case report that has been often discussed of green smoothie cleanse causing acute oxalate nephropathy in a patient. Now, it's important to note this patient did have predisposing factors, including a remote history of a gastric bypass and recent prolonged antibiotic therapy, which may have increased her absorption of oxalates, but she was doing a green smoothie cleanse developed end-stage renal disease from the oxalates, <laughs> leading to long-term dialysis. Now, this is not gonna happen to everyone who does a green smoothie cleanse. It's just to say that oxalates are real. They are present in large amounts in things like spinach and kale and turmeric and rhubarb, and they can be problematic for many people. There's a very interesting case series of autopsy that I'll show you in one moment, showing that Oxalic acid oxalates are found on autopsy in many individuals in places where there's no biological role. In fact, oxalic acid oxalates are generally a waste byproduct that is excreted in the human urine. There is a small amount of oxalate produced per day in the human body from breakdown of certain amino acids, but we can massively increase our intake of oxalates when we eat foods like this. This is actually a graphic from the carnivore code. You can see turmeric powder per 100 grams is super high in oxalates. Well, let's put some turmeric powder in a smoothie with some spinach. That's probably the most problematic thing for people, which is why it should always be avoided if you have oxalic acid kidney stones. My dad had an issue with that. Uh, sorrel is another plant leaf that is commonly consumed in wilderness adventurers, but not by the rest of us, almonds. You might add some almond milk to your smoothie and you have turmeric powder, spinach, almond milk, and maybe let's put in some uh, cocoa powder for good measure and you have an oxalate bomb right there. This is what oxalates can look like when they form raphide crystals, these needles. Sometimes they look like this, sometimes they have other forms in the human body. This is just to say that oxalates are real. They occur in plants. There is no known benefit of consuming them in your diet. And in fact, they probably inhibit the absorption of other minerals and nutrients in your diet. So this is the autopsy study, calcium oxalate crystals in the thyroid says they're not encountered in normal animal tissues, except for the human thyroid, where they were found in 79 of 100 routine consecutive autopsies. They appear during childhood. The numbers of the crystals increase with age and diffuse hyperplasia prevalence of higher 
Prevalence was higher, but crystals were fewer than expected. Now, it's interesting that the authors believe this is normal for oxalate crystals to occur in the human thyroid. There's no physiologic reason for oxalate to be in the human thyroid that we know of. And I think this is probably just an accumulation of oxalates in the thyroid because we consume them commonly in childhood leading to adulthood and they increase with age. So I don't know that it's necessarily normal for oxalates to be in the thyroid. Interestingly, they do note in this paper that people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis had less of the oxalate crystals, possibly due to an autoimmune reaction clearing the thyroid crystals out. Perhaps there's some connection between oxalate crystals in the thyroid and Hashimoto's. We don't fully know, but there's no reason for oxalate crystals to be in the human thyroid. And I think this is a clear indication that they do accumulate in humans. In animal models, oxalates are also known to induce breast cancer and accumulate in breast tissue. So you can see here, we found that chronic exposure of breast epithelial cells to oxalate promotes the transformation of breast cells from normal to tumor cells inducing the expression of a proto-oncogene as CFOS and proliferation as breast cancer cells. Furthermore, oxalate has a carcinogenic effect when injected into the mammary fat pad in mice, generating highly malignant and undifferentiated tumors with the characteristics of fibrosarcomas of the breast. And this is something that we are told is not a big deal for humans. Do we really feel safe saying that? You should eat a spinach salad every day. This is what I used to do when I was younger, I would just eat spinach straight out of the bag. I thought it was good for me. Why are we eating spinach? I just, I cringe whenever I see anybody at the grocery store eating spinach now thinking there's much better ways to get all the nutrients that you think are so valuable in that spinach, animal foods, liver, organs, without all those oxalates. So just one piece of the puzzle here with regard to the plant defense chemicals. More broadly speaking, polyphenolic compounds from plants many of which are plant defense chemicals, are known to inhibit digestive enzymes. This is the intention of plants with these defense chemicals. This is how plants do animal and plant warfare. Plants don't want to get eaten. They are discouraging you from eating them. They are inhibiting your absorption of nutrients so that you will not thrive as much and you will avoid that plant the next time you come back to it. This paper is talking about the inhibition of digestive enzymes by polyphenolic compounds. They say the ability of polyphenolic compounds to form insoluble complexes with other macromolecules such as proteins, has long been associated with the observed reduction in nutritive value resulting from their inclusion in animal diets. Okay. It is concluded that the observed reduction in protein availability found in vivo on consuming high tannin diets, plant tannins, plant defense chemicals, cannot simply be explained by the formation of dietary protein tannin complexes, and that the ability of polyphenolic compounds to inhibit digestive enzymes may be of greater significance than realized previously. So this is an interesting point. Often I hear anecdotally that people will say they have trouble digesting meat. And I ask people what they are eating it with. And if they are eating the meat with vegetables, is it possible that you are eating vegetables with tannins and that is inhibiting your digestive enzymes and preventing you from digesting other foods you're eating at the same time? Yes, it is. This is the deep, dark, interesting rabbit hole of plant defense chemicals that very few are willing to look at. But there's a good amount of data to suggest that these are actually negatively affecting human health. I spoke about cayenne pepper and paprika earlier in the podcast and their ability to open tight junctions in the gut. This is a very interesting abstract from the American Journal of Gastroenterology from 1987. The title is The Effect of Red and Black Pepper on the Stomach. If you look at this paper, people were given meals containing 1.5 grams of black pepper or 1.5 grams of red pepper to healthy human volunteers. That was compared to aspirin, or distilled water as positive and negative controls respectively. And they found mucosal microbleeding after spice administration. One subject had grossly visible gastric bleeding after both red pepper and black pepper administration. What? Why are we not told about this? I don't understand why more people don't understand that in studies in the gastroenterology realm within Western medicine, red and black pepper administration of 1.5 grams in meals causes mucosal microbleeding in the stomach and gross bleeding in one patient. These are plant defense chemicals. They're good for you. Hormesis, they say. I don't get it. This is a paper on piperine. They note that piperine inhibits UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is a detoxification enzyme in the liver. One of the reasons that black pepper is given with turmeric is because your body doesn't want turmeric, and turmeric is very poorly bioavailable, but if you give black pepper with piperine and you inhibit UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is one of the ways your body 
detoxifies turmeric or specifically curcumin from the turmeric. It adds a glucuronosyl moiety to it. Much more of that curcumin is absorbed in your body. Well, why would you want something that you have to hijack your body's detoxification enzymatic system to absorb? Don't we think that hundreds of thousands of years of human and millions of years of pre-hominid evolution are perhaps a little wiser and this curcumin molecule may not actually be that good for humans? Regardless, black pepper caused mucosal microbleeding in gastroenterology studies and also inhibits your body's ability to do glucuronidation, that is detoxify things you are eating in the same meal. Black pepper is a seed that is a plant defense chemical along with saffron and other plant defense chemicals in black pepper that I talked about earlier in this podcast. One of the more problematic compounds that is a plant defense chemical that I've talked about a lot is phytic acid. Now, others in the nutritional community have said that phytic acid is degraded when you cook it, which is not entirely true. Only 50 to 60% of phytic acid is degraded with cooking and much of it survives. And we know that from studies like this one, which very clearly illustrate that the absorption of zinc is essentially entirely abrogated when you give zinc with oysters along with something like tortillas and beans. Well, tortillas and beans have cooked grains and cooked beans, so all that phytic acid should be gone, right? No, the phytic acid isn't gone and it completely abolishes your body's ability to absorb zinc. Look at this graphic if you're watching on YouTube. 120 grams of oysters alone, this is the change in plasma zinc. This is zinc with 120 grams of frijoles, of beans. Well, those beans are cooked. They're still massively decreasing your absorption of zinc. 120 grams of tortillas, zero absorption of zinc with those oysters. But the tortillas are cooked. The phytic acid shouldn't be active in there. Phytic acid is not entirely degraded by cooking. Phytic acid is a large molecule that chelates minerals. It's found in things like grains and beans and nuts and seeds and will decrease your absorption of minerals, magnesium, selenium, zinc, generally divalent cations. So phytic acid is a big deal. Oxalates can also do that. They can inhibit your absorption of minerals. So not only are plant defense chemicals inhibiting your digestion, potentially disrupting your detoxification enzymes, in the case of black and red pepper, potentially causing mucosal microbleeding or leaky gut, they may also be inhibiting your ability to absorb minerals. Well, minerals are probably good for humans in the long run. So again, I don't see why vegetables are so good for humans in the long run. There are so many lines of evidence that suggest that they are harmful and they're better left out of your diet. And if you've listened to any of my other work in the past, you know that you can get all of the vitamins and minerals you get in plants in higher amounts and often much more bioavailable forms in animal meat organs. If you're worried about things like vitamin C, you can get that from fruit. If you're worried about fiber, which is not something that I get terribly focused on, that's found in fruit as well all kinds of good things in an animal-based diet that eliminates vegetables. Hopefully some of this is starting to sink in and make sense to you guys. You all know that I love to hate on soy. Soy food and isoflavone intake in relation to semen quality and parameters among men from an infertility clinic. You know what's coming. This one was actually done at the Mass General Hospital, uh, Harvard. Inverse relationship between soy food intake and sperm concentration was more pronounced in the high end of the distribution and among overweight and obese men. Soy food and isoflavone intake were unrelated to sperm motility, sperm morphology, or ejaculate volume. These data suggest that higher intake of soy foods and soy isoflavones is associated with lower sperm concentration. Eat your soy, men, if you don't want to have a baby. Actually not, I'm being facetious. Again, there are many isoflavonoids in soy that are probably defense chemicals that do appear to have negative effects on your hormones, men and women. We see that reflected in sperm quality, both in the Loma Linda study that I've talked about in the past and in this study at Harvard looking at soy intake and sperm or semen uh, volumes. But no one's ever done an interventional study here, so the association remains very strong. I think this is probably a good place where epidemiology can point us to a very strong hypothesis, not a whole lot in this study that I think would create a confounding effect. A type of plant defense chemical or compound that I've never actually spoken about much in the past are aquaporins. This is quite an interesting paper looking at the hypothesis that these aquaporins could be problematic for humans. Corn, soybean, spinach leaf, and tomato aquaporins have been shown to share homology with human aquaporin-4, which is abundantly expressed in human brain astrocytic end feet. So the ends of these neurons have aquaporin-4, and they say, our findings show that the percentage of neurologic tissue antibody production was increased with the number of positive food aquaporins. Of the four food aquaporins, spinach was the most common reactive. Of the four food aquaporins, spinach was the most commonly reactive. 
of the neurological tissues assessed, tubulin was the most commonly positive. Patients with antibody activity to dietary aquaporins may consider abstaining from aquaporin-containing foods in order to prevent neurological tissue damage? Wait, what? Corn, soybean, spinach leaf, and tomato could have negative effects on the brain? Again, tomato's a fruit, but it's a nightshade, so it's not something I'm a huge fan of. Corn is a grain, soybean, soybean is a bean. We just talked about soybean with negative effects in male fertility. Spinach leaf is not great because of oxalates, but here's another reason to suggest that maybe these plant parts are also creating problems for humans at a neurological level. Again, all of this work is meant to make you curious, to help spur you to do your own research. Maybe you have neurological issues. Maybe you know someone that has neurological issues. Maybe it's worth cutting those foods out of their diet to see if there's an autoimmune effect happening here. This is the question that we should not stop asking. And we certainly can't assume that these foods are always good for humans. If you follow me on social media, you know that I've also talked about sorolins in foods like parsnip and celery. There's an interesting case study of a woman who drank a bunch of celery juice and then went to a tanning bed and had a severe phototoxic injury. This isn't surprising. Sorolins from these roots and stems of plants do accumulate in the skin. They cross-link DNA and they appear to make us more sensitive to ultraviolet light. Here's an article from Science, a pretty well-respected journal, Natural Toxicants in Human Foods, Sorolins in Raw and Cooked Parsnip Root. Here's another example of a root being problematic for humans. So again, plant defense chemicals not benign for humans. The last set of plant defense chemicals that I want to talk about before I wrap up this podcast are lectins. Lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. The prototypical lectin is ricin, a compound extracted from a type of bean that has been used as a bioweapon and that is such a powerful inhibitor of ribosomal function that it will kill you if you inhale or ingest a small amount of it. So carbohydrate binding proteins like lectins can be very problematic for humans. Most of the lectins we consume are nothing along that scale of severity, but I think there's a good amount of evidence that they do affect humans negatively. Now, with regard to lectins, the main foods lectins are in are again, beans and seeds and grains and nuts, but they also occur in things like tomatoes and nightshade vegetables. And lectins are probably responsible for many of the negative effects of those compounds in the human gut. There is a very interesting set of hypotheses advanced by two researchers named was Brack and Hawk that some of the Parkinson's physiology or pathophysiology may be related to lectins. There's a series of experiments involving C. elegans worms and then mice, whereby lectins from a number of beans, specifically phytohemagglutinin in red and black kidney beans, was introduced into these animals and then tagged with a green fluorescent protein. And you can see this phytohemagglutinin moving from the gut of the worms or the mice and rats to the brains of these animals and then accumulating in the substantia nigra, the movement centers of the brain, and the animals then exhibiting Parkinson's-like behaviors in response to lectins. So this is quite interesting, especially in the context of observations like this, which have been made regarding the incidence of Parkinson's disease in Denmark and connections with truncal or supraselective vagotomy. So the vagus nerve is a nerve that runs all over the gut into the brain and vice versa from the gut to the brain and the brain to the gut. And in patients who have bad issues with ulcers in the stomach, sometimes that vagus nerve was cut from the stomach to the brain, severing the both anterograde and retrograde, both directions of communication between the vagus nerve and the gut. And this is just an observation, but it does create a striking hypothesis along with the experiments looking at the C. elegans and mice and these lectins and how they may move from the gut to the brain, accumulate in movement centers and cause problems for humans. The hypothesis being that is it possible that the reason people who have full truncal vagotomy, as they say in the study, have a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease being that something in our diets, perhaps a lectin in foods that many of us think are healthy, is moving in a retrograde fashion from the gut to the brain and accumulating in the brain of people with Parkinson's disease potentially causing problems? It's a very interesting hypothesis. It's a very scary hypothesis, but this is the reason that we need to ask these questions regarding plant defense chemicals and really be honest about how benign they really are. With regard to lectins, we also know very clearly that potatoes, something many of you love, potato lectin activates basophils and mast cells of atopic subjects by its interaction with a core chitobios and cell-bound nonspecific immunoglobulin E. So 
uh, this solanum tuberosum agglutinin, this is the STA lectin from potatoes, was found to release histamine from basophils in vitro and mast cells in vivo from non-atopic and atopic subjects. So is it possible that your eczema, your asthma, your atopic reactions, your allergies are related to potato lectin? It is possible, and perhaps we should not ignore or believe that all these foods are so benign for humans. Here's a study looking at peanut ingestion with their own peanut lectin. Peanut ingestion increases rectal proliferation in individuals with mucosal expression of a peanut lectin receptor. You can see here that peanut ingestion caused a 41% increase in rectal mucosa proliferation in individuals with macroscopically normal mucosa who express the TGAF antigen in their rectal mucosa. 10 of 36 patients studied. Uh, common expression of a galactose beta 1 3 N acetyl galactosamine alpha by hyperplastic and neoplastic epithelia may therefore be functionally important because it allows interaction with a mitogenic dietary lectin from peanuts. Is it possible, they say here, that could be an important mechanism for the association between diet and colorectal cancer? The question then being if you're eating a bean, peanuts are a bean, and you have this receptor in your rectum and it binds the lectin, could that induce? atypical, abnormal, pathological proliferation of your rectal mucosa lead to rectal cancers. Yet another mechanism by which carbohydrate binding proteins in these foods may be problematic for humans. There's also a good amount of literature from the animal experimental space looking at phytohemagglutin and other lectins in the guts of rats and mice. And what appears to happen in these guts is overgrowth of the wrong type of bacteria, almost like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, dysbiosis induced by these lectins. The mechanism appears to have something to do with mucin secreting cells in the guts. Perhaps the lectins negatively affect these cells. The mucus concentration is decreased in the gut and predominantly gram-negative anaerobic bacteria are allowed to touch the gut mucosa leading to inflammation and overgrowth of these bacteria. So in animal models, lectins also look to be bad regarding gut flora, specifically leading to dysbiosis. So where have we journeyed in this podcast? We've talked about vegetables and fruits. We've talked about the history of plants and animals and how plants have needed to evolve plant defense chemicals, how there has been an arms race between plants and animals throughout this process, that humans or other animals have evolved CYP450 systems, then plants have evolved protoxins, which are then converted into toxins by the CYP450 system. Then we talked about the anthropology of humans living on the planet in a wild fashion like the Hadza, how they don't really eat vegetables. Then we looked at multiple different types of plant defense chemicals, and we did a survey of fruit and vegetable studies showing that there are some studies that show fruit is beneficial, some studies that show that fruit and vegetable intervention does nothing for humans, and that there isn't really, in my opinion, perhaps you will disagree with me, a clear evidence in the literature that vegetables are so beneficial for humans. And I think that this calls into question the often repeated truism that vegetables are amazing for humans, that they are hormetic, that these plant defense chemicals are always good for us. We must not ignore this idea that they have side effects. And I think that my hypothesis, what the idea that I would advance is that plant defense chemicals are problematic for humans. The more you minimize them, the better you are. That's what our hunter-gatherer ancestors appear to have done behaviorally, if you find that to be a valuable data point. But there are many examples now of people who have done that and found benefits in their life. If you're thriving, why change anything about your diet? Eat your vegetables if you're thriving, but perhaps you could also be better than you are now and you don't know it. That's a topic for another day of a podcast. But I wanted to do this podcast on plant defense chemicals because I think they're widely misunderstood and people assume they're good for us because we all know vegetables are good for us. There are many different types from lectins to isothiocyanates like goitrin to polyphenols, which may inhibit the digestion of humans to tannins, which are polyphenolic, problematic for the digestion as well to nightshades like cayenne pepper or red pepper or black pepper, which cause micro bleeding in the stomach, which open tight junctions in the gut to oxalates, which can accumulate in the thyroid or cause oxalate nephropathy. In the case of the case study with the woman, and maybe they accumulate in other parts of humans causing problems. We certainly know they cause kidney stones to phytic acid, which is not entirely denatured by cooking, which can lead to problems with absorption of minerals, as we saw in the zinc study to lectins, which can cause potentially issues with Parkinson's or other neurologic diseases, similar to perhaps aquaporins from corn, soy, tomatoes, and other plants, which have homology, specifically spinach leaf with human aquaporins, all sorts of plant defense chemicals to be aware of. But the overarching theme remains the same. Plants do not want to be eaten. They're going to defend their leaves, their stems, their roots, and their seeds. Their fruit is going to be much less toxic and is probably the preferred part of plant throughout our history as humans. 
If you make a lot of your diet vegetables, then I think that can cause problems for many humans. And I think plant defense chemicals are not benign. I do not believe they have a clear hormetic effect in humans. I think that that effect is lost when you look at their negative effects. And if you look at the way that we can do hormesis, perhaps in other ways, sauna, cold, exercise, sunlight, ketosis, fasting, et cetera, I think there's no real benefit to having the plant compounds in our diet. So hopefully that's helpful and explains what, when, how, why of plant defense chemicals. But the overarching idea is that if you look at the most sought after foods for humans, meat and organs, if you don't like your fresh organs, check us out at Hardened Soil. Get some desiccated organs from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand. They're the cleanest, the best on the planet. Fruit, the least toxic plant food, honey, raw dairy. These are the foods humans have always sought. I think that if you make your diet those foods, you will thrive. Most of us want to be the best version of ourselves for our family, for our job, for whatever we want to do in the world. And that's what I'm obsessed with, helping humans understand that for most of us, the blueprint is fairly clear. Certain humans are going to react to certain foods differently than other humans. Yes, there's no one exact diet that's going to be ideal for every single human on the planet. But I think that using these themes, we can navigate the often very complex nutritional waters and understand what might be a better diet for us, especially if we are suffering. I know a lot of you are suffering. And if you're not suffering, let us know what you're doing and don't change a thing. So hopefully that's helpful, guys. Till next week.